Hello, my name is Beth Freeman. My husband Kevin and I have been members at Pelham Road for a little while now. And um, one thing that we miss about coming to church um, during this COVID season is all the smiles and the hugs and the fellowship. We really miss all of you so much. We can't wait till we get to be back together as a church family. And until then, um, we'll be here together on worship um virtually so welcome to worship good morning uh, last week we introduced a new feature to worship called waking up with we're not going to use that every week but we're going to use it several and then we're going to introduce also a children's message in a few weeks and we're also going to provide what i'm doing today every now and then about every four to six weeks i'll provide a little bit of a financial update when i call congregational members uh, you often inquire about how giving is going. So we're going to use this format to give everyone the occasional update. We ended the year strong. We are grateful to report that overall giving ended up on a strong note. Total undesignated giving was $502,441. Uh, December's giving of $68,380 was 15000 higher than December of 2019. The unadjusted 2020 results show a surplus of $12,448 for the church and $42,716 for the Child Development Center. Now these numbers will be reduced uh, as we pay the bills that came in at the end of December. Generosity is one of the seven virtues. And I'd encourage you these days when you are in your home or on your iPad more than usual, to study the seven virtues. We would all be healthier if we practice them. Your generosity is overwhelming. We are ever mindful that it is your love for God, your desire to see a world full of God's love, mercy, and justice that motivates your gifts. When we pay for the trash to be picked up or when we help a stranger out who stops at our door, we give thanks for God's provisions through his people. Thank you for your generous support. life is for us. You know what pain feels like. You are familiar with struggle. At times we are the ones struggling and at times we find ourselves a witness to the struggle of those around us. There is so much action and noise around us grabbing for our attention, increasing our anxiety, and dragging us further into the darkness. This is a winter of sadness for some of us right now. Sometimes we feel paralyzed by fear and we look for courage as there are some feelings, some emotions, and some experiences that just feel impossible to overcome. Cover us with the comfort and knowing that it is okay for us to feel. It is okay for as long as it takes to feel just as we do. It is okay for always to be just as we are. Help us continue to make this community a safe place for all people to be just as we are. Help our church be a safe place to feel just as we do. No judgment, no condemnation. It's okay not to be okay here. 
Give us the courage to keep our hearts and minds open and awake, even as the pressures of life want to close us down. Don't let us miss any and every opportunity you give us to learn, to grow, to change, and to heal. Make us brave enough to ask for help when we need it, and to give help when we need to help. Don't allow us to harden our hearts to the struggle. Help us always remember that we are loved, cherished, and held. Amen. And thank you to Esther Irvin for being the video camera person. scripture reading this morning comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. And they came to the far shore of the sea, <coughs> excuse me, into the region of the Gerizims. And as Jesus embarked from the boat, there came out to meet him from the tombs a man with an impure spirit, who had his dwelling there in the tombs, and no one was able any longer to bind him with any chain. And since he had often been bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been torn to asunder by him and the fetters shattered, no one had the strength to subdue him. And always, every night, every day, he was among the tombs and in the mountains crying out and gashing himself with stones. And seeing Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down in front of him and cried out in a loud voice and he said, What do I and you have to do with one another? Jesus, son of the highest God, I plead with you, don't torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, you impure spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And the spirit said, my name is Legion because there are many. And he implored him that he not send them out into the land. Now there, near the mountains, was a large herd of pigs, and they were feeding. And the Spirit said, Send us into the pigs so that we might enter them. And Jesus gave them leave. And coming forth, the impure spirits entered into the pigs, and the herd charged down the cliff and into the sea. About 2,000 of them. And they drowned in the sea. Good morning! Or maybe I should say good evening. Uh, I'm actually filming this on Sunday night, January the 10th. I'm outside. Uh, got a little fire going behind me. Haven't paid much attention to it. Got some lights on, so hopefully we got enough light to uh, do the sermon by. Uh, I enjoy the winter time. I enjoy being outside, and as long as the weather permits, I'll try to bring some messages from out here.
There is a saying, when pigs fly. I suppose the point of the saying is the likelihood of that happening is remote. As in like health insurance premiums are going to go down when pigs fly. You get the point. So pigs flying is a sign that something strange is happening. Something unusual is afoot. But did you know a pig has flown? First class even. It flew U.S. Airways. And the company, embarrassed, said it will never happen again. It was October of 2000. And there was a six-hour flight from Philadelphia to Seattle. And it carried 201 passengers. 200 humans. One hog which sat on the floor on the first row of first class. This was what the spokesperson for U.S. Airways said. We can confirm that the pig traveled and we can confirm that it will never happen again. Apparently the pig did not behave very well. Let me stress that, he says. It will never happen again. Sources familiar with the incident say that the uh, hog's owner convinced the airline that the animal was one of those therapeutic companion pets, like a guide dog for the blind. <laughs> the pig was traveling with two unidentified women, and they claimed they had a doctor's note that allowed them to fly with the animal. U.S. Airways and the Federal Aviation Administration rules allow passengers to fly with service animals. The animal became unruly as the plane started to taxi, towards the Seattle terminal, running through the jet squealing, the report said, trying to get into the cockpit even. Many people on board the aircraft were quite upset, but there was a large, uncontrollable hog on board, especially those in first class. Maybe it happened before Lewis Carroll, but it is Lewis Carroll who I remember as entering this phrase into literature. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. Pigs flying is improbable, but not impossible, as we just heard. Over the years, many silly things have been said or written about what else is impossible. And I love to take note of all these silly things that have been said about what is impossible. The telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value. That was Western Union, 1876. Heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Lord Kelvin, president of the Royal Society in 1895. Everything that can be invented has been invented. That came from the, the U.S. Patent Office in 1899, Charles H. Duell. Airplanes are interesting toys, but of no military value. Marshal Ferdinando Fuchs, professor of strategy. The wireless music box has no imaginable commercial commercial value. Who would pay for a message sent to nobody in particular? Who indeed? Stocks have reached what looks like a permanent high plateau. Irving Fisher, professor of economics, Yale, 1929. Man will never reach the moon, regardless of all other scientific advances. Dr. Lee D. Foster, he invented uh, the... Uh, television tube. I think there's a world market for about five computers. That was Thomas J. Watson. He was chairman of the board of IBM. <laughs> the bomb will never go off. I speak as an expert on explosives. That was Admiral William Lee, U.S. Atomic Bomb Project. You see, people just have always assumed these things are impossible but they're wrong. Here's one of my favorites. We don't like their sound. And guitar music, well, it's on the way out. That was Decca recording, rejecting the Beatles album in 1962. Well, that was one of my favorites, but this one, again, this one's a favorite too. So we went to Atari and said, hey, we've got this amazing thing. Even built it with some of your parts. And what do you think about funding us? 
Or I tell you what, we'll just give it to you. We just want to do it. Pay our salaries. We'll come to work for you. And they said no. So we went to Hewlett Packard and they said, hey, we don't need you. I don't even think you two have finished college. That's what Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, who started Apple Computers, were told when they pitched their first idea for the Apple. If I had thought about it, I wouldn't have done this experiment. The literature was full of examples that said you just can't do this. That was Spencer Silver on the work that led to the unique adhesive on 3M post-it notes. The concept is interesting, well-formed, but in order to earn better than a C, the idea must be feasible. A Yale University management professor, in response to Fred Smith's paper proposing reliable overnight delivery service, Smith went on to found, as you know, Federal Express. And one last one. Uh, the ultimate case of misjudgment. I'm just glad it'll be Clark Gable who's falling on his face and not Gary Cooper. That's what Gary Cooper said on his decision to not take the leading role in Gone with the Wind. Now, when Jesus heals this man, he sends pigs flying. They go over a cliff. The story is told as if it happens instantaneously. Maybe it did. You know, if you've read the Gospels enough, you know that the Gospel writers are not terribly interested uh, in time or sequence. Their point is never about time. It's just that Jesus provided the opportunity for change. And change happened. You know, it's not nearly as interesting a story if Jesus does this deed and turns to the man and says, Well, you know, today was a good start. See you tomorrow just doesn't have the same flavor. And we usually don't read scripture that way. We always figure with Jesus one visit and that's all. That'll get it done. No returning in seven to ten days. But maybe there's no mention of this being an ongoing project because aftercare is not nearly as intriguing as surgery. Maybe. Maybe it was instantaneous. But maybe this took time for this man to be clean and healed. The bottom line, though, really doesn't change at all. The bottom line is someone who was broken is fixed, repaired, changed. Change happens. With God, time, a willing person, and maybe a good doctor or a good teacher, change happens. The tomb-dwelling, chain-wearing man was certainly not on the travel brochure, was he? He was the person the Chamber of Commerce didn't want you to see. As soon as Jesus arrived, this man came running to greet Jesus. Jesus attracted the wounded like a burning house attracts firefighters. He cried out to Jesus, swinging his chains and yelling at the top of his voice, being disruptive. The town's folks didn't care much for this man. He was a stain on their town. Maybe he was an abused child. Maybe he was neglected by his parents, molested by a stranger, possibly. Maybe he had gotten addicted to some strong drink. Maybe his second wife left him and took all of his money. Possibly, as we now know, he had a chemical imbalance. The reason he was in this state is important, but it's actually impossible for us to determine from this distance. Whatever had happened to him, though, had broken him. And this community had no room for broken people. So they exiled him to the tombs where his antisocial behavior could not be seen. Can't you just imagine the town folks in their gospel? Do you think do you, do you, do you think that tomb dweller that fell out there will ever ever change? Will do you think he'll ever get over his children's death? Well, I heard that uh, what's bothered him is that uh, he's drank too much. I think it's messed with his brain. I don't know if he'll ever get over that. And finally, somebody would pipe up and say, Well, you know, he'll change when pigs fly.
Today, you may carry something in your past. It's none of our business what that something is. For years, it has exiled you from the mainstream. It has been your little secret. It has locked you up. And you're wondering if you will ever get past it. Get past the hurt. Get past the pain. You are wondering if you will ever be your old self again. All you want to do is fit in. Feel normal. But the depression or the anxiety makes you feel like a second class citizen. Will you ever? Will you ever get over the death of your spouse? The estranged relationship with your children, the abuse you took as a child, the verbal abuse you endure still, the losses you have experienced, or your mental health concerns. You may think it is only a remote possibility that anything can be changed. You may believe that you will change when pigs fly. Did you hear? Pigs have been known to fly. Today may be the day when pigs fly in your life. It may involve a caring therapist or a good advisor or some time, but it can happen. It may happen by nightfall or it may take some time for it to happen. But you can be changed by taking the first step today. Call it an addiction or disappointment or even a disease. This morning, make a step. Step away from the past that's holding you. Ask Jesus to remove the spirit and inspire you to see a doctor or to call your estranged children. Don't, don't, don't get concerned about how this will happen. Start instead with the first step. The first step towards Jesus is just this humble prayer. Jesus, You've helped others change. Please grant me the strength and ability to make that call. See a doctor or tell someone about my abuse. Be with me as I go forward and change. Amen. God bless you.
Savior comes to me, healing me with gentle grace and sacred dignity. Please join me for the benediction. God, bless those who wander, those who are tired, those who are afraid, the confused, the bewildered, the perplexed, the lonely, the forgotten, those who are beginning again, those who live with regret, those who struggle to forgive, the anxious, the unsure, the limping, the exhausted. In the name of the one who reassures, renews, comforts, and give rest, we pray. Amen. Sure.